So it's my pleasure to speak to you today. In my role with Landauer, I work with hundreds of hospitals across the country on a range of issues around patient dose. Uh, one of the common things I work with them on is meeting the Joint Commission standards. And I want to start by sharing a story of one of the hospitals I've worked with recently. So this hospital wanted to meet the Joint Commission standards specifically around patient dose and the new requirements for looking at fluoroscopy patient dose. So they went and purchased some dose monitoring software to help them with the process. And what they were told is that this will help them with their, it'll cut down on the staff time that's used to look into this. It'll lead to better patient care and it, it'll help them be compliant with the standards. So they spent a lot of time implementing this software to help them out. And several months later, what happened? Well, the staff has more burden than ever. They've shown little improvement in patient dose, and they're still unhappy with how they're meeting the standards. Not all their data is even coming across to the software that, that they implemented. So what went wrong? Well, part of it was a, a lack of understanding of what the software was going to provide. But this is a story I've seen from a lot of hospitals to varying degrees. Some have been more successful and some have been less. But there's been some common themes that, that it's more work than they anticipated to implement these solutions to help them. And they're not getting the results that they were looking for. So what I'm here to tell you today is there is a better solution. There is a better way to do this. It, it leads to less staff burden, less time spent managing data, and more time spent focusing on patients. It leads to better patient care, and it leads to stress-free compliance. To help you get there, I've devised four steps. Step one is to define your goals. Step two is to implement the basics. And these are things that can be done in most hospitals without much investment. Step three is to optimize your patient dose, which is a new and exciting uh, program that we're offering. And step four is to reduce the staff dose. When we're looking at the risks from fluoroscopy, I think it makes sense to start with what are the effects that patients see. Fluoroscopy uses higher radiation doses than most uh, imaging that's performed at the hospital. You can easily get doses that are in the, uh, that, are, that can go up to even above 10 gray. Well, if you have between zero and two gray as your peak skin dose, you really won't see much in the way of effects. Between two and five gray, you might see some temporary effects, but nothing long-term. Between five and 10 gray, you start to see a little bit more of an effect and some that even linger for a long time in, in, for, for recovery, but there won't be any permanent effects. Between 10 and 15, you start to see more severe effects taking shape and some of them that could even be permanent. And greater than 15 gray, that's when you start to see those severe effects um, the skin burns that are going to require surgery and skin grafts to, to repair. So this will help put us a little perspective around some of the recommendations I give you later. Well, in looking at those effects, uh, I reviewed a paper that was called Am I Missing Something? It was written from the perspective of an interventionalist that does hundreds of procedures every year and they have never seen a serious skin effect as a result of any of the procedures they performed. And they were wondering if they were doing something different or wrong. Well, it turns out the FDA recommends, that, or, sorry, FDA um, estimates that there are 1,700 expected skin injuries from fluoroscopy each year. Now, there's a wide uncertainty on that number because of what I'm about to tell you next. There's only nine reported skin injuries from fluoroscopy each year worldwide. So there's, there's a huge mismatch between what we think is happening and what's being reported. And a lot of the reason for that is because there aren't a lot of requirements for you to report skin injuries. So they're going unreported, which leads to poor data of how often they're actually happening. But we do know that they are happening. Because in that same paper, it turns out that there are 13 
court cases filed in the U.S. related to skin injuries from the radiation used in fluoroscopy each year. So we have more court cases than we have reported incidents of skin injury. And a lot of the reason for those court cases is because the patients were misdiagnosed. They were diagnosed with everything from bug bites to allergic reactions. And as a result, they were mistreated. And that's what leads to a lawsuit. So a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today revolves around communication. Communication with the staff, communication with the patient. These are two of the, the key principles in being successful in managing your fluoroscopy doses. Now the Joint Commission took notice of this as well, and that's probably why a lot of you are here today is to talk about the Joint Commission requirements. So let's take a look at what the Joint Commission's put out. There's a new set of requirements that is going into effect, has gone into effect this year. And the first requirement is all about documenting the radiation dose. It says that you must record the cumulative air kerma or kerma area product in a retrievable format. They do say if your system does not support the kerma, cumulative air kerma or kerma area product, then you can record the fluoroscopy time in a number of images. And that's important because there are a lot of older pieces of fluoroscopy equipment out there and hospitals may be looking to upgrade them, but it might take some time. So having a way to, to meet the standard with the older equipment is really important. Now note that this element of performance does not apply to fluoroscopy equipment used for therapeutic radiation or for uh, mini C arms. The second requirement says that hospitals have to identify radiation exposure and skin dose thresholds that if exceeded trigger further review and or patient evaluation. And the Joint Commission does point you to the NCRP document. I'm going to share some recommendations from that to help guide you. And they also say you can use the cumulative air kerma, kerma area product, or fluoroscopy time for these thresholds. The third requirement that's really relevant is that the hospital reviews and analyzes instances where their radiation exposure and skin dose threshold levels were exceeded. The, note the Joint Commission doesn't really tell you what it means to review and analyze. They leave that up to you, and I'm going to provide you with some of my recommendations of how to go about doing that, at what dose level is it appropriate to do what steps. And one of the last things I want to focus on is the human resource requirement. This requirement stated that the hospital had to provide education to in, any individual who used fluoroscopic equipment. The thing that's important is this requirement has been removed. Effective immediately, the Joint Commission is deleting the standard HR.01.05.03. So many of you are probably already aware that this requirement has been removed, but what you might not know is why it has been removed. There are two main reasons. The first one is the Joint Commission felt it was too hard to meet this standard. And a lot of that's because of the way it was worded. It said anyone who uses fluor fluoroscopic equipment, which might be staff at your hospital, but it also might be ancillary staff that are involved as well. So it was very open-ended and made it very difficult to show that you were meeting the, the standard ent entirely. The second reason is it's redundant. It's redundant specifically with a requirement from 2005 that says the staff competence is assessed and documented once every three years or more frequently as required by hospital policy or in accordance with law and regulation. And just as a note on this requirement, in 2017, this was actually at the top of the list for requirements that were most frequently cited as not compliant. So, yeah, this is still a requirement that the Joint Commission is focusing in on today. And what I've heard from the Joint Commission is they're not going to stop asking about the human resource requirement for education. They're just going to focus in on this element of performance rather than the new one that has been removed. The last thing I want to mention is Sentinel events. Uh, this is not new. Sentinel events have been around for a while. And the Sentinel events are defined by the Joint Commission as an event that could be associated with death or major loss of function. In fluoroscopy, 
It's defined as having a cumulative dose that's greater than 1,500 rads or 15 gray to a single field within a six to 12 month time period. These are considered to be preventable. And if it occurs, you do need to conduct a root cause analysis. You do not have to report it, but voluntary reporting is encouraged. And the whole root cause analysis process focuses on the process, not the individuals. That's really important to keep in mind if one of the, these events does happen at your facility. It's not about assigning blame. It's about searching for solutions to prevent it from happening again. The reason I wanted to bring this up is Sentinel events have been something that people are aware of, but they may not have had a good mechanism to actually keep track of what was the dose to a patient over a six to 12 month time period. And now with the new Joint Commission standards requiring you to document the dose, all of a sudden those tools are much more available. And I expect we're going to actually see more Sentinel events than people realize were occurring once you start looking over that six to 12 month time period. Another note, uh, they do give you some leeway. They say six to 12 months. What does that mean? Is it six months or is it 12 months? Well, I always use six months as a starting point. The reason why is because the effects from radiation are not exactly cumulative. There is repair and recovery that happens in between the radiation events. And we don't have a lot of good science on this, but what we do know is if the events are separated by a longer time period, they are less additive. And once you get beyond six months, it, it begins that they don't really add together as much. So I think the six month time period makes a lot of sense. And there are actually other bodies that recommend using that six month window. So that's my recommendation as well. So just to summarize up, after looking at the risks to the patient and the standards from the Joint Commission, some of the common goals from hospitals I work with are, to establish policies for high-risk procedures, ensure that the staff is highly trained, inform patients of the risks and benefits, reduce rates of skin injury. I should have actually added another one saying, quantify the rates of skin injury, manage unavoidable skin injuries correctly, and reduce staff dose. And I'm gonna hit on all of these items as we go through the rest of the presentation. Before I move into the next section, just a reminder for anybody who's joining late, if you do have a question, type it in the Q&A panel and we will get to it at the end of the presentation. Do not use the chat feature because we won't see it there. Make sure you type it in the Q&A section. All right, so step number two in our process is implementing the basics. There is a there was a paper that came out that looked at a number of root cause analysis, analyses that happened as a result of high doses in fluoroscopy. And here's what they found as the most common corrective actions taken. The top three were developing policies for high-risk procedures, staff education, and improving policies for high-risk procedures. So these three account for over half of the corrective actions at these hospitals. I think that's really telling because this all focuses on having good policies in place and having highly educated staff. If you do those things, you can cut down on the vast majority of high dose events that, that occur. So we're gonna focus in on those areas in this section titled Implementing the Basics. The first requirement, the first recommendation I have is around documenting the fluoroscopy dose. There's actually a lot of questions around this. I'm gonna keep it very simple. The best way to meet this requirement is by sending the radiation dose structured report to your PACs or the RDSR. The reason that's the best way to do this is that provides the most detailed information that will allow you to look at the patient's dose in much more detail later on. And I'll give you some examples of how that's useful. But without that level of information, there's actually a lot of uncertainty as to what the real dose to the patient was. And you need all the details that are in that RDSR. So if that's available on your system, that's the best way to meet this requirement. Option number two, send a dose summary page to PACS. 
Some systems do not have the RDSR, but they do have a pretty detailed dose summary page. It may contain a list of exposures, and it may even contain the cumulative dose broken down by different body regions. This is really useful if you do need to go back and calculate the peak skin dose to a patient. A physicist can work with you to take that information and come up with a reasonable estimate of the dose to that patient. If you can't do either of those methods, then you're going to be stuck with manually recording the dose. There's this, a couple different methods you can use. You, oftentimes, you can record it in your PACS, a manual input field into your PACS, which is a great way to do it, because then at least it's in the PACS and it's, it is easily retrievable. The PACS is actually called out specifically by the Joint Commission as an, example, as an example of a retrievable format. You can also dictate it into the patient's record. This is a good option because it increases physician involvement and raises awareness around what the doses are. And that's a good thing because we're going to talk a little bit later about staff education and getting them more involved in the process is always a good thing. The third thing you can do if you don't have those options or if they're just too difficult to implement is you can record the dose in a logbook. That logbook could be electronic or it could be pen and paper but just write down what was the cumulative arcurma or curma area product, or if you don't have those, the fluoroscopy time and number of images. You can always translate it from whatever you write it in to some other more permanent format, but just have a way to record it and then make sure you save all those files. Now, I know some of you are probably listening in thinking, what about dose software, dose monitoring software? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but what I'll tell you for now is, with the hundreds of hospitals I work with, I have seen that there are errors with data not getting into the dose monitoring software a lot of the time. And those errors are not always caught until much later. So I just want to raise some caution with relying on those tools. If you don't have the right staff in place to support it, you may not be getting everything that you thought. And I will show you a better solution where you can rely on the software knowing that everything's coming through, but we'll get to that later. My second recommendation is to check the studies in the last 6 to 12 months for patients that are undergoing high-risk procedures. Now, what is a high-risk procedure? Um, there's actually a formal definition of this. It's if, if the procedure type exceeds notification levels more than 5% of the time. And we're about to talk about notification levels in my next set of slides. But there is a definition. But I think we all know what the high-risk procedures are. Things like cardiac catheterizations, neuroembolizations, things of that nature, where you know that you're using a high dose very frequently. Now, it's important to check the last 6 to 12 months, because if you find out a patient has had previous exposures and they already have a high dose, their skin may be more susceptible to radiation injury. And it's important to notify the physicians of this because they may be able to apply techniques to avoid irradiating the same area of skin again. You also need to consider these past exposures when assessing for sentinel events. So again, it's part of the process. Check for those so you know it's there. That way, if you see that you're, you had another high dose, you'll know that you might have had a sentinel event. My third recommendation is implement notification levels. Notification levels are used during the procedure to raise awareness of the dose. They are not to stop a procedure. I want to say that again. Notification levels should never be used to stop a procedure. They might be part of a decision that a physician would make about the balance between the benefits and risks to the patient. But on their own, they should never be used to stop a procedure. Well, the NCRP does give us some pretty good guidelines on what to use as notification levels. They have a nice table where you can say, for different metrics, what notification level should I use? The most common one that's used is the cumulative error kerma, the second row in my table. And if you hit three gray, somebody will stop and raise their hand and say, I just want to let everybody know we hit our first notification level and then every one gray after that. And the point is that this raises awareness in the room, and it allows that physician to perhaps change their behavior 
they they might ease up on um, the pedal if they can use the last image hold uh, maybe take less less digital acquisitions or they might try to apply some dose optimization techniques like spreading the dose over different body regions Just by raising the awareness of the people performing the procedure, what you'll find out is the number of really high dose events drops just by this one implementing this one recommendation. Now, what happens if, at the end of the procedure if you do have a high dose? Well, there's something called a substantial radiation dose level, and the NCRP recommends a value for cumulative air karma of five gray. And what this would do is it would trigger an organization, uh, it would trigger the organization's patient follow-up process. Now, why five gray, you might wonder? Well, if you think back to the beginning of the presentation, that's when we started to see more long-term effects and more pronounced short-term effects as well. So if you get that five gray level, there's a real chance that you'll see a, an effect on that patient, and it may require some additional care and treatment. Again, you should never stop a procedure because you're worried about going above a substantial radiation dose level. This is only checked after the procedure is done so that you know whether you need to follow up with that patient. And that follow-up should happen two to four weeks after the procedure. You should notify the patient that a substantial radiation dose level was used, inform them what, the skin, what skin reactions are possible, indicate where to look, and emphasize that the effects can be minimized with proper treatment. It's important not to scare our patients. They might have just come in for a very serious procedure, and we don't want to scare them any further, but we do need to be clear and communicate with them so they know what to expect, and we can all communicate moving forward and treat them the best way possible. The best time to actually notify them of this is at the time of discharge and let them know that you'll be following up in two to four weeks to see if they have any skin redness or any itchiness or anything like that. If you have a dose that gets above 10 gray, I recommend performing a peak skin dose estimate. The reason why is because the peak skin dose could be higher or lower than the cumulative air karma. It depends on the table height, it depends on backscatter factors, depends on the table pad attenuation, it depends on many, many parameters. So you should consult with a qualified medical physicist, somebody that can help guide you through the process. They should be able to evaluate whether a sentinel event has occurred. And yeah, if you have a dose of 10 gray, if all that dose was to one field, you might be close to that sentinel, sentinel event threshold. So they should be able to guide you on whether a sentinel event has occurred and also inform the physician of what the possible skin effects might be so that they can better manage the care and treatment for that patient. Now let's talk about the staff education piece. Many people already expect that their staff is already educated on this, and that's, that's often true. But according to one survey that was conducted, only 25% of physicians were, or 25 of physicians were unaware that interventional procedures used ionizing radiation. That number is kind of alarming. I don't know exactly how this survey was conducted. I don't know. If, I don't think that this is an accurate portrayal at many hospitals of the staff that are actually involved with interventional procedures. But it's still an alarming statistic. And 43% of medical students were unaware that interventional procedures use ionizing radiation. So this really highlights that we need to do more to educate our staff to make sure they know what the possible side effects are and what techniques they can do to minimize the dose. The staff should be trained for the type and complexity of procedures that they're privileged to perform. And they should be educated on their process in the radiation safety program. There are several good options for staff education. The first one is Landauer Academy, which I'll tell you more about in a second. There's also the Association of Vascular and Interventional Radiographers. Uh, they have a number of presentations that are available online. Another great resource is the AAPM Educators Resource Guide. 
to keep an updated list of different um, presentations or self-training modules that you can take. And then lastly, there's Image Gently has a really good set of modules specifically around pediatric fluoroscopy, but many of the principles apply to adult fluoroscopy as well. One of the problems with many of those options is that it's hard to keep track of who is taking them and whether they pass the course. Landauer Academy offers a really nice solution because it integrates with your health stream and we can deliver the content directly to your staff. It's easy to keep track of who's taken and who's passed the course and make sure that all your staff stays up to date on their competencies. So if you want to find out more about Landauer Academy, you can go to landaueracademy.com. Now let's talk about the public's knowledge of the risk from medical radiation. According to a survey of patients that came in to receive diagnostic procedures, 92% of them were not informed of the radiation risks. 25% believe there was an increased risk of cancer from getting an abdominal CT scan, which according to the best of our knowledge and science, that is the correct answer. So one out of four patients got that correct. Now, some of you might be aware that there is some debate in the scientific community about exactly what those risks are, and you might say, well, maybe the question was worded in a way that maybe some patients, some of our knowledgeable patients, uh, weren't sure how to answer it. But I'll point you to the last statistic. 56% of patients believe there was an increased risk of cancer from the ionizing radiation used with an MRI. MRIs don't use ionizing radiation. So this survey really showed that our patients are not very well informed on what the risks are, and they're probably not very well informed on what the benefits are either. So my question to you is, do you really want the patients to be making decisions about their health care without having all the information? And would you rather that they get the information from you or from the Internet? Here's a little bit more about the psychology of perceived risk. It turns out the way most people perceive risk is in two areas. It's how, how much control do they have over something and how much can they see the effects? How observable is it? The less control and the less observable something is, the more unsafe it seems to them. This, uh, this graphical representation shows you where a couple of common things fall in this spectrum. Basically, the more to the right and the more to the top, the less safe it seems. The more to the left, the more to the bottom, the more safe it seems. Here's medical x-rays. So we're pretty much in the middle, um, something that appears somewhat unsafe, but I'm not that worried about it. But to put this in perspective with other things that people encounter in daily life, medical x-rays were perceived as being more unsafe than chainsaws, driving, and alcohol. Now, I don't know if it tells you anything that alcohol and driving are so closely linked on this, this graph. Of course, if you combine them together, it becomes much less safe, in my opinion. Uh, so, but medical x-rays were perceived as more dangerous than all of these three. Now, what about things that are similar in terms of perceived risk to the public? Smoking. Uh, smoking was somewhat less controllable than x-rays, according to the survey, but um, it was con considered more observable. So it's about the same in terms of overall risk from the perception of the, the general public, and somewhat, uh, probably even somewhat safer than medical x-rays is police work and firefighting. If you want to look for something that the public perceives as really unsafe, Nuclear power is the number one option. This is kind of surprising because the experts tell us that nuclear power is actually very safe and has very little health effects, but that doesn't match up with what the public perceives. The only way to counteract this is to provide the best information you can to your patients. And one of the ways that's done is through informed consent. You don't need to use informed consent for every diagnostic procedure done at a hospital that might use radiation. If the risks are small enough or not even well enough known, it doesn't make sense to, to use informed consent. 
But if you're performing a high-risk fluor fluor fluoroscopic procedure, then informed consent definitely makes sense. And you want to tell the patient about what are the risks, what are the benefits, are there alternative treatment options, and finally, get their approval to proceed. So to summarize this section, before you perform a procedure, you should make sure that your providers are well-trained, you perform informed consent for high-risk procedures, and you identify patients that might be at increased risk for skin injury. During the procedure, implement notification levels to raise awareness and reduce the dose rates as is reasonable for that patient. After the procedure, you should record the dose, implement substantial radiation dose levels. That'll tell you if patient follow-up is necessary and perform dose estimates as needed. Again, before I move into the next section, I want to remind everybody that you can submit your questions to the Q&A section. Again, don't use the chat feature because we won't see them. Submit them to the Q&A section. We'll get to them at the end of the presentation. All right, let's talk about step number three, optimize patient dose. Optimize is a new offering from Landauer. What it does, it includes automated data collection for CT and fluoroscopy, unlimited physics support, and all aimed at stress-free compliance. It really takes our existing service we've offered called our Clinical Dose Optimization Service, or CDOS, and really takes it to the next level. We incorporate the right technology so that we can better assist the hospitals we work with to get the best results. You might be wondering what makes Optimize different than some of the other solutions that I alluded to at the beginning of the presentation that some hospitals have struggled with. Well, the answer is really our group of experts that's working with you. Optimize isn't just a software solution where you're left on your own to figure out what to do with the data. It combines software and the service together to give a complete offering. When we do the setup and implementation, we make it pain-free. We validate your data, map all your CT protocols to a common nomenclature, and we help set expected dose ranges. Then we monitor the data that's coming in. We notify you of any equipment downtime. We review your dose incidents and provide recommendations on how to follow up with those patients. And we review any CT protocols you have as well. And we advise you on what to do to optimize your CT protocols. We provide dose estimates to manage patient care, specifically in fluoroscopy, that comes up a lot. And we provide suggestions to reduce the frequency of dose incidence. Finally, we resolve issues with you as a team. That's why we offer unlimited support. We want to make sure we answer any of your questions, whether they're technical, scientific, or regulatory. One example of how this process works is a, using a peak skin dose calculation. Uh, There's actually a hospital we work with, um, I was speaking with earlier today, where they had a patient come in and the dose was estimated to be a, more than 10 gray. We were able to take the radiation dose structured report and use that to look at every single exposure. What was the angle? What was the table height? How was the patient positioned? And reconstruct that dose to create a peak skin dose map. From that peak skin dose map, we can tell what was the true peak skin dose to that patient. And then from that information, now we can start to say, how can you really manage that patient? Without that level of detail, the accuracy on peak skin dose estimates is not very good. They're accurate to within about 50%. If you have all the detail from all the exposures, you can get to be much more accurate. The setup is pretty simple. It follows what many other um, systems out there do. The technologist will image the patient. That data goes to the PACS. And then we can take the data either from the PACS or from the imaging modality directly and it goes to what we call an on-premise site server. It's basically a DICOM receiver that is listening for patient dose information. It takes the relevant information out and sends it to the cloud. 
in the cloud, we can we can perform some advanced analysis of that data, and our physicists all have access to view it, so that they can help guide you and provide recommendations back to the hospital to fix any problems that come up. I like to use the analogy of a credit card company, because with my credit card, I can go in and set my own spending limits, but I don't go into it very often to manage my data. But what I do love is they're monitoring it in the background. And I've had a couple times where they've called me up and said, hey, we noticed some suspicious activity on your card. Where, have you been out of the country recently? And I've said, no, I haven't. And they said, okay, well, let me get that taken care of for you. And they told me exactly what to do next. And that's how our service works. Our team of experts is listening to your data and we're watching for problems that you may not even know are occurring. We provide all of our information back to you using an online portal. You have access to dashboards that give you everything you need to see, including a, a, a very good overview of what you need for compliance. You have access to reports, uh, CT protocol review, um, LeapFrog, if you participate with the LeapFrog, we give you all the data you need for that. Health system standardization. And you also get our physicist recommendations. You can see any recommendations that are open. You can also see all the past recommendations that have ever been given. And finally, the ability to schedule questions or ask questions or schedule meetings. You can open a ticket with our team and we'll get back to you, or you can schedule a live meeting. Uh, we're even investigating live chat options. Those are currently not operational, but something we're looking into to see if there's an interest. And I'm pretty confident that this service is really what most hospitals need. And the reason why is because of the feedback we get from our customers. This is one of, uh, feedback from one of our customers, and then what I want to point out is that they emphasize how we work with them and teach them and help them uh, be ready for the Joint Commission survey. Notice the emphasis is all on having somebody that helps you guide you through the process and take some of that burden off of your staff. What a lot of solutions will do is they create more work for you rather than less. Our goal is to make it as easy as possible to meet your objectives. Another reminder, if you have any questions, submit them to the Q&A section, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. I'm going to move into step number four, which is on reducing staff dose. There are risks associated with working in the fluoroscopy suite. Papers have shown there's an increased risk of cancer for the staff members involved. There's a significant increased risk of cataracts. And we know that this is related to the radiation that they're being exposed to because 67% of all cancers are on the left side of the body, which is the side that's usually closest to the, um, the x-ray source. And 85% of the head and neck cancers are on the left side of the body. So the question comes up, are we doing everything we can to provide a safe environment for our staff? I do want to emphasize the risks are small in an absolute sense, but can we do anything to make it even safer? Well, one of the things people try to do is more shielding. Makes sense because you're trying to block the x-rays. But the other problem that orthopedics have is um, lots of, uh, uh, sorry, orthopedic problems are, are very prevalent. 28% of interventionalists report hip and knee and ankle problems. 33% miss work time due to orthopedic issues. And 60% of people report spine issues after 21 years of practice. So more shielding is probably not the best answer. One really innovative technology, piece of technology that's out there is the RaySafe i3 real-time dosimeter. What it does, it's different than all the other products, is it provides you the information you need to actually change behavior. It allows you to see the doses to the staff members involved in real time. So they can adjust and, and perhaps adjust where shields are placed, adjust where they're standing in the room to minimize their exposure. Here's the picture of the system actually, uh, you know, in, in action. And you can see that the staff is able to quickly look up and see what their current dose rate is, and then they can change and adapt. And 
And this system has been shown to lead to real results. According to one study, there was a 45% dose reduction among technologists that were using it, and a 66% dose reduction among radiologists, just by implementing the system. It, seeing the data in real time really does change people's behavior. And it also makes those staff members feel a lot safer. This is a quote from one of the technologists about how much safer he felt after using the RaySafe i3 product. So those are the four steps for success in managing patient dose and staff dose in fluoroscopy. Define your goals, implement the basics, and that's where I made a number of policy recommendations, and then optimize your patient dose, and finally, reduce your staff dose. And now we're going to open it up to questions and answers. That's awesome. Thank you, Olaf. That was really informative. So we have a lot of questions here. So we're going to try to get to them as, to, as many as we can. So I'm going to kick off with a question from Tony Fiskel. Uh, where can we obtain thresholds for different ages in exams? Yeah, if you're talking specifically about fluoroscopy, um, that there's not a lot of good recommendations on there um, that are out there for pediatrics. There's a couple different ways you can look at it. One way you can look at it is in terms of deterministic effects, the thresholds aren't that different than they are for adults. Uh, perhaps they, they might be a little bit lower because the cells in, in uh, pediatrics are a little more radiosensitive, but that's mostly for cancer induction. So that's one approach that hospitals will take, is they'll just use one threshold for adults and pediatrics. Um, the, other, the other problem is there aren't very specific recommendations for different types of procedures, and that's because we lack the data. In CT, we have a national dose registry. In fluoroscopy, we don't have that yet. Now, I am uh, excited to announce that Landauer is actually working towards creating one among the hospitals we work with, so that we can actually group fluoroscopic procedures together and compare doses among our hospitals and develop better benchmarks. Say what doses are appropriate for pediatrics for different types of procedures you're performing. But right now, the data doesn't exist. That's great. I have another question here, Olaf, from Max Samuro. Would you kindly comment on the, jo uh, the Joint Commission requirement for fluoroscopy dose of staff? I'm sorry, can you repeat the end of that again? Uh, comment on the Joint Commission requirement for fluoroscopy dose for the staff. Um, I'm not sure which specific requirement is being referenced. If you could enter that in, mm -hmm. that might okay. help. What about this, Max, if you're still on the call, if you could reply on the Q&A, then I'll bring that question up again. Let's move on to the next one. Um, Another question here is, how long do these records need to be kept? Yeah, good question. The Joint Commission doesn't really specify that. Um, the, the way I would look at it is it's part of the record of that exam for the patient. So I would follow your policies, your guidelines for how long you store all the other data related to that exam. Great. I have another question here from Jackie Horn. Which medical staff members, which medical staff member is in charge of following up with the patient if they have exceeded the skin dose during a procedure? Technologist, physician, radiologist, who would that person be? The physician is the one who ultimately owns that. Now, there might be other staff members that are involved, and that might depend on hospital policy. But it's the ph performing physician that is, uh, that is called out by the NCRP document is the one who owns that process. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for all your questions. If you still have them, keep them coming. Here I have another one from Robin Burke. According to the Joint Commission, 
do you only have to record do you only have to record high risk procedures or are all plural procedures required to be recorded you have to record the dose in a retrievable format for all fluoroscopy procedures at least all procedures that are performed excluding uh, therapeutic and mini C arms. Great. Uh, another question here, a uh, really good question. Uh, at what point in the care process are you seeing informed consent being used? By the ordering provider so they can prepare and not decide last minute to avoid the procedure? Yeah, it needs to be fairly far up in the process. Um, for exactly what you just mentioned, you, you don't want to have surprises at the last minute. Great. Um, let me get this one. What about in a surgery center setting? Is fluoro time recording enough? So the Joint Commission says that you need to record the fluoro. T it, first of all, they say if you have the Kerma and Kerma area product, that's what you should be recording. And the reason why is those are much better indicators of the dose to patient, the patient than the floral time. If you don't have access to them, then you can use floral time, but you, you do need to use floral time and the number of images. Really what they're talking about is the number of digital acquisitions you have that are involved with a higher dose. Great. Uh, I think we have time for four more questions here. So the next one, Olaf, is um, when looking at previous doses in the past six to 12 months prior to high-risk procedures, do we only have concern about exposures at the site or sites that will be ra uh, radiated? That's right. Yeah, if, if, you're, if you find a, a past exposure but it was to a different site in the body, then the effects are not going to be to add together. Okay, this is a question about Optimize. Is patient identifiable information removed prior to uploading data to the cloud? Oh, the, the question is, is it removed? Yes. And the answer to that is yes. We are removing PHI before sending it to the cloud. We have had requests from some hospitals to look at cumulative dose for patients even across hospitals within a single health system. And that's something we are looking into. That would require that we take PHI to the cloud. And that, you know, that's the only way that we would really have a way to do that. So we're looking into that option. But right now, we remove PHI. OK, great. I have a question here from Kelly. What is considered high dose fluoroscopy procedures? So. The notification level that's recommended from the NCRP is 3 gray, the cumulative air kerma 3 gray. Uh, if you only have floral time, it's 30 minutes of floral time. If you exceed that on a, uh, on a somewhat regular basis, and the way they define it is more than 5% of the time you go above that level, then that's considered a high-risk fluoroscopy procedure. So again, let me answer that. I want to make sure I answer it clearly. If more than 5% of the time you're exceeding 3 gray or 30 minutes of floral time, that's a high-risk floral procedure. Okay. So the next question is a clarification here. Uh, the person wants to confirm that mini C-arm doses don't need to be recorded. Is that true in all states? Could you comment on, on that? The Joint Commission has excluded mini C arms from their requirement. And, and that applies, the Joint Commission requirements are across the whole country. Now, I am not aware of states that specifically require mini C arms to be recorded. So, in most states, you will not need to record it. Uh, I don't want to say that there are none because I haven't. You know, uh, I, I'd have to look through the requirements for every state to make, to make sure of that, but not that I'm aware of. Okay, great. Now I'm just jumping in to see the latest questions. Uh, does your system report results to the ACR data registry? So it's an optimized question. 
and to answer that, I'd say Optimize is a very new product for us, and there's still a lot of features we're adding. One of them is to become a certified DIR partner. We have not yet done that. So right now, it does not report to the DIR. It is something that's on a roadmap that we will be doing. And I also want to share with people that they may not know, but there is going to be a national registry for fluoroscopy. I know the ACR has been working on it for a number of years, um, and that's something that is expected to happen in the relatively near future, but I don't know exactly when. The next optimized question here is, can optimize be added or used together with Redometrics? Yeah, the way I'd answer that is it absolutely could. Um, now, for Optimize to work, we need to get the data directly because there are things that we look at that Radiometrics does not. For example, we're looking at image quality and CT scans. That's something that's not captured by Radiometrics. But the two systems can, can both run at the same time. Now, Optimize does not need a tool like Radiometrics to collect the data because it is collecting all the data that's needed on its own. So uh, the way to answer is, yes, you can do it. You don't need to. Okay. The next question here is, most fluoroscopy units, the question is from Amy, most fluoroscopy units can't calculate or transfer the dose. How can Optimize assist with that? Good question. So one of the things we do is we have the ability to import data. So if you're recording the dose, say in your packs, and then if you're able to run a report, a lot of hospitals we work with are, are doing that. They record it in their packs and then run a report where it exports it as a CSV file. We can actually read that CSV file in and import the data from your older fluoroscopy equipment so that you can see all of your doses in one platform. Okay. Uh, we one can also more. do it with a manual log if you're doing it that way. Okay, let's try to sneak in uh, two to three more. Erica is asking, how do you work with the hospital system, with the hospital system's radiation safety committee? There's a lot of different ways that hospitals choose to do that, but it's very common that we either set up a meeting before or after the radiation safety committee, or sometimes even just take the first uh, 15 minutes of a radiation safety committee meeting to present our findings and analysis. Okay. I have here a question. Uh, a lot of people ask you to do a quick recap on the Joint Commission standards because they didn't join the first 10 minutes. So I think this question might be a good opportunity for us to just provide a quick summary on that. So Tosha Noel is asking, is education on equipment still required by the Joint Commission for all staff, performing physicians, technologists, and ancillary staff? Yeah, so to address that, the, the Joint Commission removed the human resource requirement that was added this year that was specific to education on fluoroscopy. That has been removed. And the reason it was removed, one of the main reasons is they found it was redundant with the requirement from 2005 that said that you need to ensure the competency of your staff at least every three years or more frequently as required by hospital policy or state regulations. So there, there was already an old requirement that said you need to have ensure competency, which includes continued training. And they felt the new requirement was redundant and a little bit too open-ended, making it hard to, um, to demonstrate compliance. So the new one's gone, the old one's still in effect. Good. Um, I, got a quick, I got a request here for you to please quickly repeat the answer for the surgery center settings. It was, uh, what about the surgery center settings? Is fluoro time recording enough? Yeah, just to quickly repeat it, the answer is if you don't have Kerma or uh, Kerma area product, then you you need to record the floral time, but you also need to record the number of images. All right. Um, and then this other question here is from Veronica. Is a 72-hour follow-up on patients too soon to do? Uh, in 72 hours, you won't see a lot of the effects. Um, you, you might, depending on the dose level, you might see some, but oftentimes the effects from radiation take 
a, a while to appear. One of the things I didn't put in here just for the sake of time is to look at the progression of the skin injuries. And it really does take a little bit of time to see the full effects. And then sometimes what you'll see in the, in the really severe cases is it actually starts to get better. You know, a couple months afterwards, you start thinking everything's looking better. And then you start to see the real damage if you have those high doses. So this mm -hmm. kind of sweet spot for looking is in that two to four week time period. Great. Uh, another question here from Nancy. What parameters are included in the optimized reports? Well, it depends a little bit on which report we're talking about, but um, we, you know, we, we can look at all of the parameters that are available. So like in fluoroscopy, we can, we run data that looks at the cumulative error kerma, kerma error product, floral time. We can look at the peak skin dose. We can look at what equipment was it performed on, who was the performing physician, um, how much time was floral time versus acquisition time. You know, there's a lot of different things that we can look at. And in the world of CT, there's probably even more parameters. So it's a little hard to answer um, because there's a lot that's looked at. Great. Just uh, before I ask another question, I just want to let everyone know that this webinar was recorded and we will be sharing all the materials with you guys uh, as soon as we can. So the next question is from Jennifer. Um, she says, we are establishing excessive thresholds at three standard deviations above average dose, mostly for real time. Does that seem realistic? These are all way less than 30 to 60 minutes. And the answer to that is absolutely it does. Uh, in fact, in some states, there's a recommendation to do two or three standard deviations from the, from the, uh, um, the mean. And if you do that, what you'll find out is you'll probably get between 1% and 5% of cases that go above that, uh, depending on exactly where you set those thresholds. But for some procedures, you can have a much lower threshold and not go above it very frequently. Like, you know, a barium swallow is totally different than a cardiac catheterization. Okay. So, so the, yes, it does make sense. All right. So this question is from Amy, and I apologize if I'm reading the acronyms wrong. So MIPS requires fluoro time and number of images or dose in their reports for only certain CPTESs. Now the Joint Commission is stating it would need to be in for all fluoroscopy cases. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Good. Let's see if I can, we can get to one more question that's coming in. Um, this question is from uh, Mark Seeley. How does Optimize handle changes in equipment identifiers that may occur during a software upgrade to avoid unknown equipment being created? Yeah, so we actually have a whole team that manages the equipment. So like if a software version changes, instead if some other products out there, you'll end up getting, uh, it, it looks like you have 30 different pieces of equipment when you only have five because something happened that made it look different. We have a whole team that manages that for you, and we look for any changes, and we make sure we merge that equipment. Most of the time, you don't even see it happen. We might ask you to confirm and say, hey, it looks like, uh, you know, we see these two pieces of equipment that look like they're actually one. Can you just confirm that before we merge it? But, yeah, that, that's, that's part of our process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think... The same person also asked, can you clarify what is the benefit of Optimize versus the DIR? Uh, they're really in very different categories. So what the DIR is, it, it gives you benchmarks from across the country, and you're participating in building those benchmarks. Now, that is something that we can do at Landauer as well, but Optimize is really a service that's designed to help you manage your doses using software to assist it. So whereas the DIR is just collecting and giving you benchmarks, we're looking at the data, analyzing it, providing you with recommendations and advice, and helping guide you through the whole process. So I, I, I actually look at both of them working together. Awesome. So this question is from Troy. I'm going to, uh, we've been here for about an hour, so I want to respect everyone's time. I'm going to ask two more questions. 
And all the other questions that we didn't get to, we will try to get to you via email uh, latest next week. So two more questions here, one from Troy. Why would the number of images be important in fluoroscopy when those images come from the accumulated time of fluoro? Uh, I think what the Joint Commission is really talking about is the high quality images that are required because those ones are associated with a much higher dose. So if you're taking a high quality image for to record, um, you need to capture how often you're doing that. Great. Uh, I think this is a really good question to close the webinar. So it's from Sherry Brock. What are the essentials to include in a fluoro policy? Yeah, I, I to answer that, I would say it, it starts with, it, you have to look at is what do you need to do before, during, and after the procedure? And bef I summarized it a little bit earlier in my talk, but just to stay, state it again, before the procedure, you need to look at whether informed consent makes sense and look for past exams to see if the patient's at an increased risk of skin effects. During the procedure, you should use notification levels to raise awareness in the room, and you should try to implement dose reduction techniques where you can. And then after the procedure, use substantial radiation dose levels to determine if patient follow-up is necessary. And you should consider performing peak skin dose estimates if you go above 10 gray. Uh, on top of that, I would also say staff education is really critical. Mm -hmm. All right. Any any last words, Olaf, for us to close the webinar? No, I, I thank everybody for participating. And if you have any more questions that you haven't been able to answer today, um, feel free to reach out to us, and we'll do our best to get an answer to you. Yeah. Would you mind uh, going to the next slide? I just want to share here. Uh, or email. So any questions, please email marketingfeedback at landauer.com. Any comments, suggestions, questions, we will get back to you as soon as we can. And if, if you want to learn more about Olav and his team, we also have information here at landauer.com slash optimize. Thank you so much for attending and stay tuned for the next webinar. Thank you.